the exam tomorrow. Uh, just so you know, uh, it takes a little while, especially a two hour block to upload to YouTube. So I'm thinking it's gonna be between eight and nine tonight. But you guys are here, so you know exactly what's gonna happen at that time. You'll know what had transpired. Okay, so. So first, before we get started, I want you guys to know that um, Yes, this is a, a test that is a lot different than the third test. It's very straightforward. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not. It's still a lot of information. Uh, so don't underestimate it. But it is very straightforward. If you know the hormones, if you know their target cells, if you know their actions, you know what I mean? It's very, you know, there's nothing tricky about it. It's just you, you have flashcards work great. Right? If you, it's a lot of information. So don't underestimate it, but just know that it's a lot more straightforward than, it's not as um, abstract as exam three. So what I would say is um, do know the anatomy of the GI tract. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't worry about teeth. I mean, I rolled this out for both classes knowing that there are some people that are thinking about dental school, and I wanted to talk about uh, the teeth in particular. I actually had some students that said thank you for that, but that will not be on your exam. I do want you to know the salivary glands, okay? So I um, want to make sure that you guys know the three types of salivary glands, the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands. Salivary fluid is usually made up of mucins, Salivary amylase, so if you guys remember amylase, we talked about that with the pancreas as well. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks carbo uh, carbohydrates, polysaccharides, down to disaccharides. And bicarbonate and lysozyme. Okay, so uh, basically, lysozyme is a, an enzyme, it's an antimicrobial. Helps to lower the amount of bacteria already in your mouth. So, knowing the anatomy, you guys, the parotid gland is the largest gland. It's kind of located in the uh, upper mandibular, upper jaw. <coughs> and this one is at rest. It only accounts for about 25% of salivary fluid. But once you start to eat something, it ramps up to about 50%. The parotid gland secretes a very serous fluid, so it's very watery. And when we're talking about salivary amylase, it's actually coming from the parotid gland. Okay, so the parotid gland, again, produces a very serous fluid that contains amylase. All right, the other extreme is the sublingual gland. That's a very tiny gland underneath the tongue. And it only accounts for about 3 to 5% of salivary fluid. But this is the gland that produces a lot of mucins, thick mucus. That's where I talked about my dog. When he's sitting patiently waiting for treats, it just gets longer and longer. OK, so sublingual gland, rich in mucins, produces a very thick fluid only accounts for about 3 to 5% of salivary fluid. And then the submandibular gland, it's a mix between the, it's kind of intermediate between a very serous and a very um, mucin-rich gland. And at rest, it usually accounts for about 60 to 70%, but then once you start eating a meal, the submandibular gland decreases its secretions as the parotid gland ramps up when you eat. All right, any questions, you guys? Pretty good? 
Okay, so do you know something about these glands? What are their function? Salivary gland is important in lubricating food, digesting polysaccharides to, by amylase, <clears throat> dissolving the food, so a lot of those uh, nutrients and um, molecules can bind to taste receptors, gustatory receptors. And again, that lysozyme, lysozyme already cleanses the mouth with the antimicrobial properties. Okay, so taking a look at a closer look at the salivary glands, um, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic autonomic nervous system stimulates salivary fluid. Okay, so they, this is one of the only structures where both the parasympathetic, usually, you know, they have antagonistic actions. This is one of the only structures where both parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulate salivary fluid secretion. Okay, so when you take a look at this, this structure right here is supposed to symbolize the capillaries, the blood supply. Salivary glands are typical acinar glands. They're an exocrine gland. So I had a good question in my office. What's the difference between exocrine and endocrine? Exocrine glands, they secrete their fluid into an open cavity like the mouth or the duodenum. Endocrine glands secrete into the blood supply, into the circulatory system, okay? So this is a typical exocrine gland known as an acinar gland. The primary secretions are very plasma-like. So if I say they're isosmotic, right, they have the same osmolarity as plasma, very plasma-like. And then those secretions are modified in the duct portion. The flow is actually regulated by these myoepithelial cells that can contract and restrict flow, or they can dilate and increase the flow. And usually what happens is sodium and chloride are reabsorbed, recovered, and brought back into the body. And the secretions are usually hypoosmotic, right? You're reabsorbing all of those salts, and so that the fluid that enters into the mouth is hypoosmotic. Pretty good? Okay. Um, so just remember those myoepithelial cells too, they can constrict to regulate the flow. And I think that's about it. Both parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulate salivary secretion. Okay, so we talked about the taste receptors. I thought this was really interesting, especially the sweet taste receptors that are actually, um, they are expressed in the small intestines as well. Um, but we're not going to go through too much, right? This isn't going to be the focus on the exam. Again, taste receptors are not going to be on your exam. The swallowing reflex has both a voluntary and an involuntary stage, okay? The voluntary stage happens first. And when you put food in your mouth, you voluntarily, you know, with your tongue, move that food to the back of your throat pushes that bolus of food into the pharynx, and then the involuntary phase takes over, where the soft palate rises up here. So here's the hard and soft palate with the tongue. The soft palate moves up to protect the nasal cavities, and then that bolus of food <coughs> slides down the esophagus. The epiglottis, right, that's an omega-shaped structure, bends down to protect the trachea when you swallow as well. All of that is involuntary. So soft palate rises up, epiglottis bends to close off the trachea. And then we talked about the esophagus, okay? I do want you to know the upper esophageal sphincter and lower esophageal sphincter. These are true sphincters, unlike the pyloric junction. They're made up of circular smooth muscle, 
Remember they have a basal tone associated with them. So if, we, if you guys remember this slide, if you, this, uh, these series of graphs here on the right-hand side of this figure uh, is giving you some information about pressure, right? The y-axis is millimeters of mercury, okay? So this is pressure. This is the x-axis is time. So over time, you can see the upper esophageal sphincter here has a basal tone of 30 millimeters of mercury. So already it has a tone, it's constricted. And once that bolus of food enters into that area, that pressure drops, the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, allowing that bolus of food to move through that area. And that's where you get the increase as that bolus of food moves into that area, an increase in pressure, and then it returns to its original value, okay? So there's a relaxation event, and then this pressure change afterwards is due to the bolus of food causing a little bit of stretch against the walls, and that's what it's measuring there. Then you can see that that bolus of food moves down the esophagus, but there is an anticipatory relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter seconds, many seconds, before that bolus of food enters into that area, okay? So this is called an anticipatory relaxation. Okay, does that make sense, you guys? The LES relaxes way before that bolus of food enters into the area. Again, it has a basal tone of about 30 millimeters of mercury associated with it. Okay, so going back to this one, remember the upper esophageal sphincter is under skeletal muscle control. The lower esophageal sphincter is under um, smooth muscle control. Okay, so you can see it in this figure too. Here's the esophagus. You can see skeletal muscle at the top and smooth muscle here at the bottom. So when I was talking about myasthenia gravis, remember, uh, that attacks nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, so it causes muscle weakness of this upper part of the esophagus. Uh, dogs that actually have myasthenia gravis, a lot of times they are um, diagnosed because they have something called mega esophagus, which causes the upper part of the esophagus to distend when they eat, eat food. So I had another student who works in clinics at, uh, in 3301. She showed me these high chairs for dogs that have myasthenia gravis. They actually put the dogs in like a high chair with their paws so they, the dogs are sitting straight up when they eat because they're having trouble swallowing with myasthenia gravis. It's actually pretty cute. It's, uh, they, I mean, these are big dogs that are sitting in high chairs to help them eat which is, I didn't know until last week, which was kind of cool, or the week before. All right, um, any other questions, you guys, about the esophagus? We talked about a type of motility. Did I lose this? Yeah. Did I lose this? I, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. So um, we talked about a type of motility in the, um, in the esophagus called peristalsis. You guys remember that, peristalsis? Peristalsis is a coordinated contraction between smooth muscle and longitudinal muscle. So when you swallow food called a bolus, it's like a wad of undigested food, circular smooth muscle constricts behind the bolus of food where longitudinal muscle shortens. It kind of pushes that food down the esophagus. I use that sweatpants. Um, uh, analogy, you guys remember? Okay, so just remember the motility in the esophagus is peristalsis. Okay, right along. Stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have any specific questions. Just going to go to the next one here. All right, with hormonal control of digestion, there's a lot of figures that um, 
are hard to find in the textbook. So let's go through some of these. And if, uh, specifically when we talked about enterochromaffin-like cells, it's hard to sometimes interpret that particular graph. Let's, let's start uh, here, though. Um, I want you guys to know the anatomy of the stomach. Here's the esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter. Again, some people know this as the cardiac sphincter. So if you were in animal diversity lab, you probably know this as the cardiac sphincter. Um, the top part of the stomach is called the fundus, then the body, and uh, towards the pyloric junction is called the antrum, okay? We'll talk about chief cells and parietal cells in just a second. All right, so uh, when we're talking about the cephalic phase, this is actually uh, part of the, okay, so let me take a step back. There's the three phases that I want you guys to know with GI, cephalic phase, gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. Okay, so the main differences are, wow, okay. The cephalic phase is when you haven't eaten anything yet and you're basically just seeing food, smelling food, you haven't put anything in your mouth yet. So this is kind of giving you some idea of what's happening with the cephalic phase. Already, uh, you have input, you have signals coming from the central nervous system to the stomach. And these are all mediated through the vagal efferents. So basically what it's doing is it's releasing probably ATP or VIP to cause relaxation. This is called receptive relaxation. So already you're getting relaxation of the fundus in order to accommodate any food that's going to be coming into the stomach. Anticipatory relaxation. It's called receptive relaxation, describes a condition where relaxation of the fundic region of the stomach precedes the arrival of a bolus into the stomach, okay? Now, once you actually get any kind of food into the stomach, then you move into the gastric phase. And you can see this symbol right here, it looks like an M sort of with an extra. This symbol right here is a mechanoreceptor. So it's detecting the food that's already entered into the stomach, sending a signal to the central nervous system and back. That's a long reflex. It's called a long reflex. And then it's also ramping up acid secretion, also causing relaxation, and increasing the peristaltic, these waves, okay? A lot of the waves are, uh, the motility in the stomach is driven by these pacemaker cells. It's super interesting because it, those cells are expressing the same pacemaker channels, the funny channels, as the SA node in the heart. So it's very rhythmic, it's auto, it's basically known as autorhythmicity, and it causes this peristalsis. Okay, so there's different types of muscular contraction in the stomach. The circular smooth muscle constricts the body of the stomach. Longitudinal muscle shortens it and the oblique muscles actually twist it. So there's a lot of like, it's a kind of a violent place when you think about it. A lot of mixing and churning, a lot of acid being secreted. This is all the gastric phase. And then I just wanna mention this retropulsion, okay? So retropulsion is when that food enters into the pyloric junction, there's gonna be an immediate constriction. You can see that right here of the pyloric junction, and then it's gonna kick the food back into the stomach, part of that mixing process. That's called retropulsion. So again, a lot happening during the gastric phase. Yes? So um, back to the efferents and afferents. Yep. 
Okay, so afferents with an A send signals from the stomach to the central nervous system. Efferents, they actually send signals from the central nervous system <coughs> to the stomach. Okay, and usually these are all mediated through parasympathetic neurons, the vagal neurons, which are all parasympathetic, part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So again, just like uh, if you guys remember back to exam one with the neurons, afferents with an A send signals to the central nervous system. And in this case, it's actually being sensed by the mechanoreceptors. And then that signal is going to the central nervous system. S uh, signals from the central nervous system to the stomach are from the efferents with an E. Okay? Yeah. So the mixing kind mm -hmm. of situation, is that mediated by the pacemaker cells? Yeah. Okay. So there's the autorhythmicity that's due to those pacemaker cells. But there's also a lot of vagal input as well. So it's still both. It's still both. Yep. It's still both. All right. You guys pretty good with that? OK. So then we talked a little bit about vomiting. Took this right from Wikipedia. Uh, basically, in this case, um, I wanted you guys to know the difference between vomiting and regurgitation, though. OK. So vomiting is a very complicated process mediated by the vomiting center in the uh, medulla, medulla. And basically what happens is pressure builds in the stomach. A lot of times it's due to constriction of the abdominal muscles. You get an increase in pressure in the stomach and then you start to retch, right? When you retch, you breathe in against a closed glottis. You guys remember the epiglottis? When you do that, if you guys have ever tried that, you actually create a pretty good negative pressure in the upper esophagus. So with the increase in pressure in the stomach and the negative pressure in the upper esophagus, you create a pretty good pressure gradient. And then as soon as that lower esophageal sphincter opens up, food just propels out of your mouth, OK? So it's really about pressure changes. Your, um, your case study on alcoholism actually talked about a Mallory Weiss tear, right? That's actually due, again, to those, that pressure gradient can be so forceful that it causes a tear of the lower esophageal sphincter, OK? Totally different than regurgitation. Regurgitation is just reverse peristalsis. So it's a different mechanism. Okay, so when you're talking about baby birds regurgitating food, they're, they're moving food from their stomach by reversed, like reverse peristalsis. Okay? So you can't use those two interchangeably. OK, so uh, a student was in my office actually talking about the review questions for GI as well. There was one about vomiting. Remember, vomiting is going to cause a profound metabolic alkalosis. You vomit off all of those, that acid. After you've transported all of this bicarbonate into the blood, the alkaline tide, if you throw up, it's going to cause a profound metabolic alkalosis, OK? There's an increase in heart rate, the sympathetic response. You probably lose a lot of fluid, and that's why you have low bodily uh, blood volume as a result as well. OK, so let's get to the heart. Let's go to the cellular level, right? It's important to understand those parietal cells and how they work. This is going to, there's a lot of questions pertaining to chief cells, parietal cells, enteroendocrine cells, so might as well kind of dive into that. So this is the way the stomach wall is organized. It's organized by, you've got a mucosal la layer, mucosa, submucosa, and then all of that smooth muscle, longitudinal circular smooth muscle, is kind of towards, um, away from the stomach lumen, okay? 
So there are tight junctions to prevent any kind of leakage. Mucus neck cells, they secu secrete mucins. And then the parietal cells, they secrete acid. And don't forget intrinsic factor. OK, so you want me to go through that, the intrinsic factor? Parietal cells secrete acid. They reabsorb bicarbonate. And then let's talk about intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is essential for life. It helps your body absorb B12, the vitamin B12, in the ileum. OK? In the ileum. What does B12 do? It helps with red blood cell formation. The way I remember this is if you don't have intrinsic factor, it causes something called pernicious anemia. You guys know what anemia is? Anemia is basically when you have, there's a lack of red blood cells, basically. It causes fatigue. OK. Say it one more time. You guys pretty good? Intrinsic factor, OK, you're good? OK, intrinsic factor, B12, red blood cell formation. If, if that's not working properly, the result is pernicious anemia. OK, pretty good. So this is the figure from your textbook. Again, it's just kind of showing you these gastric pits, the mucous neck cells, chief cells, parietal cells, and then the muscularis layer. I think this is probably a lot of information, but they're redundant slides. Yeah? Are you going to have any of these cellular diagrams like on the exams that we should know how to play with it all? Not cellular. OK. So more structure anatomy type. Uh, so going forward, you guys, the diagrams are multiple choice. I'm not hand grading anything. <laughs> OK, so no, I'm not doing it. So, um, so basically, the diagram, if you guys can remember back, let's say, when we talked about the pump, and you had potassium, sodium, ATP, ADP, if you guys remember that, it was like 2, 1, 5, 3, 4. So on the exam, it'll be, please order the structures according to 1 through 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then it'll be A. ATP, ADP, right? It's better to label the diagram, and then you'll be able to see right of it away. One, number one, two, three, four, five. It'll be in order. You'll have four, three foils and one correct order. Does that make sense? OK, great. OK, so let's take a look at this one. Parietal cells, again, secrete acid and intrinsic factor. I like this diagram because it shows you that chief cells secrete pepsinogen. And then take a look at this. It's actually the acid coming from the parietal cells that are converting pepsinogen to pepsin. Pepsinogen is the precursor. It's the inactive form. Pepsin is the active enzyme that breaks protein down to smaller peptides. OK? So let's talk about the stomach for a second. Remember, mucins are being secreted by the uh, mucous neck cells. Uh, just so you know, these epithelial cells also secrete bicarbonate. So not only is the mucin layer on top of the stomach rich in bicarbonate, <laughs> right underneath that mucus layer is a layer of bicarbonate. So you probably wondered, oh my gosh, how do my epithelial cells survive with a pH of 1 to 2 after I eat a meal? It's because there is that mucin layer and a rich bicarbonate layer right underneath that to protect the epithelial cells that line the stomach. Okay. All right, so this is a really important diagram. There, I know of two questions in particular that are pertaining to this one. This is a parietal cell. OK, so remember, parietal cells secrete acid. We're kind of zooming in again, zooming in on that parietal cell. So how do they secrete acid? Uh, 
You've seen this reaction a thousand times before with red blood cells, right? Kidney, carbon dioxide and water is converted to carbonic acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. You even had uh, the case study with exam three related to carbonic anhydrase. Uh, carbonic acid is then converted to bicarbonate and protons. And for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted into the lumen of the stomach by the potassium proton pump. This is a primary active transporter that uses ATP to pump protons into the stomach lumen and potassium into the cell, parietal cell. This potassium channel here is just to make sure that the potassium isn't rate limiting to keep the pump going, right? And then with the net movement of protons into the stomach lumen, chloride follows. So when I say you are secreting acid, you're literally secreting hydrochloric acid into your stomach, hydrochloric acid. Okay, so a lot of the drugs, right, if there's an application type problem, a lot of the drugs that help to reduce acid in the stomach, they inhibit this pump. <coughs> and they're called PPIs for a reason, proton pump inhibitors. PPIs, like omeprazole. And on the exam, it'll be something like omeprazole, a PPI, you know, a proton pump inhibitor, blah, 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 right? Then you'll have to, it's that type of application problem. Okay, so for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed into the blood. Okay, so bicarbonate is actually transported by the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. This is what's known as the alkaline tide, right? You're transporting all of this buffer into the blood. Now, I wanna connect the dots for you guys right now. The bicarbonate is then used during the intestinal phase when a little bit of acid comes from the stomach and it enters into the duodenum, you've got those S cells that are detecting that acid, right? They secrete secretin, which triggers the pancreas to secrete bicarbonate. So all of that part bicarbonate you just loaded into the blood in the stomach after you ate a meal is then gonna be used to neutralize the acid in the duodenum. Kind of see how that works? Okay, so just wanna make sure, this is all part of the gastric phase, but in a minute here, we're gonna go, we're gonna revisit the intestinal phase. Okay, so there's a lot of regulation by, of the parietal cells. Again, this is still parietal cells. These are our acid secreting cells, and there are hormones and neurotransmitters that regulate acid secretion. We've got three stimulatory signals and one inhibitory signal. So also in the endocrinology section, you guys, today, I keep telling you somatostatin. If you don't remember exactly what somatostatin does, a good guess is seriously it inhibits everything, okay? So in this case, again, it also inhibits acid secretion. So you can see these proton potassium pumps, right? With stimulation of gastrin, histamine, and acetylcholine, you're actually inserting, inserting more pumps into the apical membrane of those parietal cells to secrete more acid. So this was something that I know a lot of students missed on exam three. These are what's known as preformed, preformed uh, transporters that are just sitting, waiting to be inserted. So when you have a, a quick 
cascade of events that occurs, say, with gastrin stimulation, it's going to insert these preformed pumps right into the membrane. All right, so let's bring in one more complication just to make it fun, right? Here's the ECL cells. So the top blob, I'm just going to call it a blob right now. Uh, the top blob is the parietal cell, and the bottom one is the enterochromaffin-like cell. Enterochromaffin-like cell. Okay, so here's the story. During the cephalic phase, right, that's where you haven't eaten anything yet, but you see food, you, you smell it, you know you're going to be eating soon, you're going to get a little bit of uh, acetylcholine released by those vagal, those parasympathetic neurons, those efferents, right, vagal efferents, and those G cells are secreting a little bit of gastrin. That's a hormone that is actually being delivered into the blood. So right away, even during the cephalic phase, you're going to get a little bit of acid secretion by the parietal cells by these cascades, right? Acetylcholine is going to bind to its receptor. Gastrin is going to bind to its receptor. It's going to cause a little bit of acid secretion. You'll notice that it increases calcium, you guys. These are GQ-coupled receptors. So it's a pretty fast-acting, fast-acting. All right, so the system in the gastric phase now ramps up. Now you've eaten food. You've got the vagal afferents and efferents, these long uh, reflexes. And now the acetylcholine and gastrin start to ramp up the ECL cells. And they now secrete histamine. So you can see how this is a mechanism to ramp up the system with acid secretion. Now, here's how I put it. When histamine is on board, this is the trifecta. Histamine is a GS-coupled receptor. Alone, it produces a little bit of acid. But when all three are on board, the trifecta, this is where you get something called potentiation. Potentiation means that the amount of acid that's secreted is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Does that make sense to you guys? So acetylcholine alone uh, causes a little bit of acid secretion. Histamine alone causes a little bit of acid secretion. And gastrin alone, it causes a little bit of acid secretion. But when all three are on board, the amount of acid that's secreted is greater than the sum of the individual parts, acetylcholine, gastrin, and histamine. That's called potentiation. All right. So these slides, you guys, are more just review slides. It's telling you something about G cells in the stomach. G cells actually secrete gastrin. Here's a good kind of look at between the cephalic and gastric phase. Here's the G cells right here. G cells, they are uh, basically um, endocrine cells. They secrete gastrin that end up in the circulatory system that feed back to the parietal cells. But it's not until you have the gastric phase where you have these long reflexes all the way to the central nervous system and these short little reflexes too that also increase hydrochloric acid secretion. So go back to this one. Again, it's just this would be the cephalic phase. This is the gastric phase. There's a number of different mechanisms that cause G cells to release gastrin. Now the uh, enterochromaffin-like cells come on board and secrete histamine and then you get the maximum amount of hydrochloric acid. If you need a table or something to really look at to break it all down, the top is the cephalic phase, the middle is the gastric phase, and then finally the intestinal phase is at, at the bottom.
you're ramping up the hydrochloric acid secretion until you get to the intestinal phase. And then everything slows down, including acid secretion. Gastric emptying slows down. It's not about dumping everything into the intestines now. It's about piecemealing it little by little to allow enough time for digestion and absorption to occur. All right, short. Here's just another slide, more of the same, long reflexes, short reflexes. You got this very violent place, lots of motility, until this is the beginning of the intestinal phase. Okay? We're still doing pretty good on time, you guys. Okay, so with the intestinal phase, now you get a little bit of food entering into the duodenum. Remember, this is the way the intestines are organized too. Duodenum is first segment, jejunum, and then ileum, and then the colon. Okay, so a little bit of food enters into the duodenum. You have these specialized cells that detect things like lipids, carbohydrates, acid, osmolarity. And you can see all of these receptors, all of these sensors, are feeding back to decrease gastric emptying, okay? They're going to increase the pyloric junction contractions, increase, it's a little counterintuitive. It's actually decreasing the amount of food that's gonna be entering into the duodenum now. And it decreases the peristalsis and it decreases the acid secretion. So it's slowing everything down, slowing it all down. That's called a decrease in gastric emptying. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's dive into this in a little bit. This figure right here is just a very simple figure that shows you some of the structural differences between the gallbladder, the pancreas, they have a common duct. They deliver all of their products through the sphincter of Odi into the duodenum. Pancreas is organized. It has both exocrine glands and endocrine glands. The exocrine glands are the ones that deliver digestive enzymes. The endocrine glands of the pancreas are the ones that uh, produce hormones like insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. Okay, so let's just go through this last slide. Let's start off with CCK here. The cells that secrete uh, CCK are called I cells. Okay, so the I cells, they detect lipids. <coughs> they stimulate the I cells to secrete cholecystokinin, which is CCK. CCK then travels in the bloodstream to the gallbladder and the pancreas. Does a number of things. It stimulates the gallbladder to contract and deliver bile into the duodenum. It causes the pancreas to release lipases. Those are enzymes that break down lipids. And they also relax the sphincter of Odi relaxes the sphincter of Odi. Makes sense though, right? It's detecting lipids from the stomach. It is delivering bile to help emulsify the fat. And then it's delivering lipase to, it's an enzyme that breaks down the fat into monoglycerides and fatty acids, okay? Secretin, okay, so it's the S cells that are detecting acid coming from the stomach. The S cells then secrete secretin, secretin secreting cells. And that secretin then travels to the pancreas and stimulates it to release bicarbonate. Bicarbonate's just been loaded by the stomach. 
that helps to, that's delivered into the duodenum, duodenum and then helps to neutralize acid coming from the stomach. Those are the S cells. These cells right here, GIP secreting cells, they are K cells, K cells. Okay, so GIP is, okay, so going back to the duodenum, these K cells are detecting carbohydrates, glucose. They then secrete GIP, and this is called glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide. So it's detecting the glucose and sending a signal to the beta islet cells to secrete insulin. So then basically your cells can take up that glucose once it's absorbed. Pretty good. G cells, going back to the stomach, remember G cells secrete gastrin. So gastrin, remember they have, they stimulate acid secretion. These other ones, GIP, CCK, and secretin, they all decrease gastric emptying and decrease acid secretion. All right, let's fly through the rest of this.